Hello, I'm Anthony and uh, this month I want to present uh, the performance of my solar panels from my back garden. It's uh, improving weather and I thought why not? So uh, to give you a recap, if you haven't watched my previous videos, um, I have a uh, solar panel array split over two rooftops and the total size of the array is generating just under nine kilowatts of peak power. Um, all of those panels are connected to an eight kilowatt solar edge inverter and I also have a hot water controller which will divert excess solar power uh, to the immersion heater in my hot water tank. So last month I made predictions for the month of March and I predicted that we would be producing 590 kilowatt hours of electricity and as it turned out we produced just under 640 kilowatt hours of electricity. Um, that's a remarkable performance. Um, so breaking down uh, the consumption side of things um, I consumed 338 kilowatt hours of electricity in total and uh, 62 kilowatt hours of that went into my hot water tank. About 106 kilowatt hours of electricity was imported from the grid. So out of uh, that month um, we've had um, some rather cloudy days right at the beginning of the month. Um, that lasted about uh, a week or so so performance was quite poor and the last two days of March have also been uh, poorly performing. So um, the worst day we had was just over three and a half kilowatt hours of electricity being produced. That happened at the beginning of March um, and the best day that was the 24th of March and we had just under 38 kilowatt hours of electricity. Um, that wasn't a day of unbroken sunshine. There were some interludes from clouds um, but it was as close to a sunny day as you could uh, reasonably expect um, and 38 kilowatt hours is impressive um, but overall um, for the month of March um, there was a, a large period of uh, days where we had um, well over 20 kilowatt hours of electricity being generated day after day and uh, yeah it's been a dry month um, and it's been pretty bright but it hasn't been uh, bright the whole day each day um, you'll find that uh, it could be sunny in the morning and cloudy in the afternoon for instance. So highlights for March. Uh, electricity generation is much much higher than in uh, February. It's uh, been very impressive. The peak output that we've had has been 7.56 kilowatts and uh, and I recorded that on the 26th of March. Um, but overall, it has been remarkable. Um, I have exported more than four times as much electricity as I've imported from the grid. And when you consider that the import price for electricity is three times higher than the export price, it basically means not paying anything to the electricity company. We've only had five days where we've consumed more electricity than we've generated. Um, and that's impressive. Um, and of those days where we were consuming more than we generated, the, the, the deficiency totaled about eight kilowatt hours over two days in the longest stretch. And if you have a 13 kilowatt hour battery, that was actually um, that would actually be more than sufficient to cover uh, that deficiency. So I do this analysis where I see how much of my electricity consumption comes from solar power, and uh, I've been doing that for the previous months. And for March, um, if I don't take hot water into consideration, 60% um, of my electricity. Uh, would have come from my solar power. Um, once you take hot water into account um, it rises up to 68% and if I had batteries as I previously mentioned um, it would be uh, up to 100% of my electricity 
uh, from my solar panels being consumed. So I've had my panels running now for four and a half months. And given my original investment of just under £11,000, um, the question is, are these panels saving me money? And over the winter time and the first month of spring, uh, the answer is £122 worth of savings. And when you examine it in more detail, um, you look at uh, grid consumption costs avoided, uh, you look at propane consumption costs avoided, and you look at uh, export revenue to the grid. And grid consumption costs avoided is by far and away the biggest saving, but the export to the grid with this size of array is not insignificant. Uh, going into the summertime, uh, grid export is going to be a far more significant source of savings. Um, but overall, uh, I have returned 1% of my original investment. So in my previous videos, I've compared my, the performance of my site with another site in Aberdeen, which also has a 9 kilowatt array. Um, and for this month, that other site uh, generated 664 kilowatt hours. So my site was within 96% of the uh, performance of that site and given that my overall uh, predicted performance is substantially lower um, uh, than that site, um, it will be interesting to see whether my site uh, keeps up going into summer. The partial shading on my site was a significant issue in the winter time. Uh, directly south from my house there is a large tree which obstructs the sun uh, shining on the solar panels. Uh, into March the sun is now tracking above that tree. However, um, as the days get longer the sun will start to falling behind other trees, uh, particularly in the early evening time. So due west um, we've got some woodland and as you can see from these pictures um, the sun will start to fall behind those trees at around about six o'clock in the evening. So that generates uh, an additional constraint to performance. Uh, but there is one other constraint to performance to discuss. So at the moment uh, my solar power is generating 5.2 uh, kilowatts and the thing to note here is the export to the grid. It's about 5 kilowatts and the, is, there is more solar power available than that um, but uh, we can't uh, generate it because of this export limit. Um, however, if I increase uh, the load on, in the house by, increase, by uh, applying my, my good old-fashioned uh, kettle, you can see now the power available has jumped to 6.3 kilowatts. So unbridled, there's a lot more power available that we can use. Um, but for most of the time, uh, in the middle of the day, I'm typically only using 200 watts. So the question is, how can we use that surplus power in the middle of the day? One option is to use underfloor heating in the bathroom. That will unbridle some of the surplus solar power in the middle of the day. However, in summertime, this isn't really an option. I've got the house warm enough as it is. Um, but in springtime, like today, it's a perfectly decent uh, op thing to do. So I can generate more solar power during the day by switching on more machines. And here you can see I'm doing some cryptocurrency mining. Um, at the very least, my machine is generating heat and it's helping keep my room a bit warmer, which is useful in the spring. Um, but I'm also making some money. Here it's suggesting I could uh, generate about 60 euros a month. The obvious solution for maximizing solar production during the daytime is to replace my diesel car with an electric one. 
So we've seen that solar panels have an abundance of electricity for electric cars for six months of the year. And the question now is whether electric cars are a worthwhile consideration right now. I've got two requirements. The first requirement is that no journey should take any longer than what it already takes with my existing car. And the second requirement is that the overall cost should be no higher than my existing car. Now, in terms of journey time, 80% of all the journeys that I do, particularly when it comes to domestic or commuting time, they are more than satisfied by the capabilities of all electric cars right now. But that remaining 20% is a big deal. We're talking about uh, weekend trips to the Western and Central Highlands, which is something I often do. And in the most extreme example, uh, driving to Glen Brittle in the Isle of Skye, that's a 400 mile round trip. And you cannot rely on there being a charger at your destination. So you need to have enough distance to do that return leg. Um, the most extreme example I've got is driving down to my mum's house. That's just under 600 miles and at the moment it takes about 10 and a half hours including one hour for stops and that's under free-flowing traffic conditions. So um, the overall cost of driving my car has worked out to be about 41 pence per mile over the last six years and 90,000 miles. And the vast majority of that cost is depreciation. Um, I bought my car at £26,500 and according to some estimates, it's about £6,000 value right now. So those are the costs and capabilities of my car that I have right now. And the question is, can any electric car match those requirements? Tesla vehicles have by far and away the longest range of any production car at the moment. And the longest range vehicle is the Tesla Model S. However, when it comes to a journey driving down the length of the country, curiously, the Tesla Model 3 long range has got a shorter journey time. And that is the car which I'll examine in a bit more detail. Um, now, at the moment, the price of a Tesla Model 3 long range is just under £50,000. And that puts the economic side of my requirements under considerable challenge. So how well does it stack up? So I made this car cost calculator. Um, I've had this spreadsheet for about a year and I've just updated it. So we've got a purchase price of just under £50,000. I'm assuming 100,000 miles a year, um, over five years, uh, vehicle excise duty of £320. Um, we've got electricity costs at 15 pence per kilowatt hour. Um, we've got uh, MOT costs, tyre costs, and we put all of this in and we have a residual value. And I'm being conservative here, but all told, the cost per mile isn't that much more expensive than the cost per mile for a Volkswagen Golf. Now, bear in mind my Volkswagen Golf costs £26,500 and this thing costs £49,990. Um, it's quite interesting to see how the cost per mile works out. And the reason why the cost per mile is comparable is because we don't have diesel to pay for. And maintenance is a lot smaller. We don't have oil changes. Brakes tend to be regen, so you don't wear your brakes out anywhere near as quickly. We don't have timing belts to replace. And the big thing though, the big assumption though, is that we don't have any out of warranty uh, repair costs. And new cars like this can be expensive to repair. Um, that's a big unknown. But look what happens if we start plugging in residual values which are closer to 
what Teslas are reputed to have. So let's put in a 40% residual value instead of a 30%. And let's consider the fact that for half the year, we're getting electricity from our solar panels. Um, so let's reduce the electricity cost down to five pence per kilowatt hour. Five pence per kilowatt hour. So electricity cost doesn't really have a big impact on, on, the, on the overall cost of driving. Um, so now I've got a cost per mile, which is down to 37 pence. I think that's interesting. Um, I've included two chi two tire changes over that time. I haven't included any accessories either. Um, so things such as the electric car charger, which has to go in the in the driveway, things like uh, winter tires and rims for the winter tires, those aren't included. But the cost per mile compared to existing cars is not outrageous. Now, when you consider that I might want to keep my car for another year, um, the purchase price might go down. It might go down to 46,990. It had suddenly gone up because of the car grant, which has just been removed. So let's put 46,990 in. Um, and let's add in some one-off uh, maintenance costs just for the sake of it. Let's say something goes wrong out of warranty. Let's add a thousand pounds. It's still pretty favorable. Um, this, I think, shows where the potential for electric cars is and the price of purchasing an electric car is going to get cheaper in the future. And it's going to mean that um, uh, petrol and diesel cars are going to become woefully uneconomic uh, to consider buying. Wrapping up this video, um, the question I want to ask is whether I have made an investment in these solar panels too early. Panel prices are falling and I haven't yet got an electric car to use up all of that surplus electricity. And I think the answer to that question is no. The returns on my investment will still pay for the investment in my solar panels. Um, and additionally, I think there are risks uh, with uh, waiting too long with installing solar panels. As more and more people install solar panels, uh, the electricity grid becomes more and more constrained. And I can see a situation where falling panel prices is counterbalanced with uh, increasing connection costs. Um, I was quoted £7,000 to have unrestricted export to uh, the grid. Uh, as it happened, I was able to uh, have a free connection to the grid, um, subject to a 5 kilowatt export limit. Um, as more houses become connected, that export limit will become more and more constrained and it wouldn't surprise me if uh, electricity network operators start charging money uh, for applications in the future. At the moment, those applications are free. Um, so it, that's something to be mindful of. But I uh, hope you have a happy Easter and uh, I will see you either on my walks or I'll see you next month.